Hello and welcome to yet another episode of the After Seven Podcast, where this is our isolation edition. We're all stuck at home. Yeah. And I thought, hey, wouldn't it be nice if we just did a nice, fun episode, something that we can just enjoy, relax, talk about some things that we all love and enjoy. And so I thought, let's just talk about our favorite Bible characters. And of course, If it was just a one-sided conversation, how boring would that be? You need other people. So I brought in the people who are the best in the business of doing the podcast. I brought in Jesse, Michael, and Mitchell. Jesse, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty well, Chris. Pretty well. (laughs) It's good to be here. That's good. How's your life in isolation treating you? It's it's isolated, that's for sure. (laughs) (laughs) As as one might expect. But no, it's all good. (laughs) Very nice. Now, Michael being the teacher that you are um i'm sure that your life has been incredibly easier since all of this began oh yeah yeah easy (laughs) that's a good way to put it Uh, um i (laughs) yeah it's 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 definitely been eventful definitely a year that i won't forget yeah i don't think it's one that anyone will be forgetting anytime soon um but let's let's head over to the man the myth the legend mitchell how have you been? Ooh, man, the myth, the legend. Uh, well, I can't say I've been earning that title uh, <laughs> because I've been sitting at home and not much else. I don't know. It's just been the, I mean, to be honest, I've been enjoying it, but. <laughs> <laughs> Is that not, not the definition of isolation? <laughs> well, but enjoy, no, I, I, I don't necessarily. Not. Yeah. You could have like isolation that you don't like, surely. My, my my brain immediately went to like how in how in movies you know some prisoner will do the wrong thing they're like yeah put him in the hall and it's just like this dank prison cell for one guy with no windows so i was like oh geez that's a pretty depressing example though like, it must be a, it must be a different experience when it's forced hey like voluntary yeah, isolation yeah. versus like you can't change this no matter how you like what you want to do yeah um, well look as i said um during this time where technically we are in involuntary uh, isolation, though a lot of the, th- the restrictions are lifting and uh, we're getting back a little bit more of that freedom. I thought, hey, it'd still be really cool if we just did like a really fun episode where we talk about something super positive and um, yeah, we can just come together and talk about something fun. So I thought, how about we just go through our top five Bible characters and um, hopefully it'll inspire you listeners uh, or potentially viewers as well in this case, to go and read some of these really cool stories that really stick to us. Um, so what we're going to do, each of us is going to give our number two favorite character, and then we're going to quickly go through our numbers five to three, kind of like our runners up for favorite. And then we will reveal our number one favorite, and then we're going to have a quick lightning round where we're going to be playing a little bit of a fun game. Uh, now, I think... Uh, I'm safe to speak for all of us in uh, by saying our favorite Bible characters are pretty well constantly in flux. Maybe we have a few that we really like, but if we did this podcast six months from now, we'd probably have different answers. And there you go. What a, that's a good idea. We could just keep doing one of these <laughs> every six months. So you might find that uh, there might be a lot of overlap between us. There might not be. We haven't looked at each other's yet because we wanted to be as equally surprised and experience it at the same time as all of you. Um, but yeah, these characters may change. This is just our top five favorite Bible characters as it is now. So I'm going to ask Michael to share his number two favorite character with us. Okay, going first. My number two favorite character, it kind of in a way feels like an anticlimax going straight from two. Um, yeah, I, know. <laughs> on I thought you were going to say the anticlimax starting with you. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's just rude. No. I wouldn't say that. Um, no, I, thought, I thought you were saying that. <laughs> <laughs> now, without further ado, my number two favorite Bible character is none other than Paul himself. The great Ooh. apostle Ooh. Paul. Ooh, nice. Very nice. Mm. Nice. Good choice. Let me let me expand on that a little bit. Um, we were talking about our favorite Bible characters and, and some of the questions Chris posed, one of them was characters that really resonate with you, characters that are really relatable. Um, and I think Paul is, is definitely those things. Um, 
Firstly, Paul's personality. Paul is really all or nothing guy. You know, he's, he's not lukewarm. Um, you look at Paul at the beginning of his life, he's really, really zealous at persecuting the Christians. Like he, he, he puts his all into this, like he's just, he's just full on. You know, he's not sitting on the fence. He's just, everything is that. And then after his conversion experience, completely zealous in proclaiming Jesus. And that's, that's an awesome transformation story. I think it's a really inspiring and powerful story. Um, and I think it speaks volumes to the power of God um, and the, the transformative power, the power um, that God can, um, you know, come into your life and just, just bring about such a rapid and, and um, um, announced change. Um, the, the, yeah, I just think that's really cool. Awesome. Um, I'll share mm. a couple of verses about Paul um, before we wrap it up, um, or rather verses from Paul. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 1. Um, Paul was someone that was, that was very humble. At least that's, um, that's how he talks about Jesus. And he says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who's enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. He said, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. So, you know, Paul acknowledges him. He's not up on his high horse anymore, literally, because he got knocked mm. off the, the horse. <laughs> um, he's, yeah. He, he's just completely changed by the love of God and the mercy that Jesus shows. And, and that's evident, I think, throughout all of his writings and his life in general. So that's awesome. why Paul takes the number two spot. Nice. And if like there was a highlight chapter or book of Paul's that you would recommend to any Ooh. of our listeners at home? Um, definitely my favorite book by Paul is Philippians, hands down. That's, that's an easy one. Oh, um, awesome. There's just so many gems in Philippians. Um, you, you think about that famous verse, Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. A really good verse. Think mm. about chapter 2, which talks all about Jesus. Um, talking about Jesus humbling himself, becoming, being, becoming obedient to death. Things like that. I mean, um, chapter 3, to live is Christ. I just love Philippians. Yeah, Awesome. We should do favorite books of the Bible next. Oh, I like <laughs> you know? it. Let's do it. Let's do yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's turn to the legend himself, Mitchell. Who's your number two? Who makes it into those top My, two spots? I'm actually really excited about this. Uh, do you want to like, everyone just go to John chapter nine real quick. I'm not like going to go through sure. the whole thing, obviously. But um, it's, as you were saying, Chris, our, our favorites are in flux. And yes, this one has come into my radar sort of more recently compared to of the other ones. Um, so John chapter nine, uh, and it's about the man who's born blind and receives his sight. Now, this one, I do remember when I first read this story uh, as a young one, I sort of just breezed over it because I felt like a whole lot of jargon. Um, like when he gets into the, the argument with the Pharisees, it just felt like so much just wordage, you know, like, and stuff that I didn't really care about. I was like, I want to read more about the miracles. I want to read more about, I don't know, what Jesus did, what people did, that kind of stuff. But um, more recently, as I said, mm. I came across this. So the story starts off, and it's just about, like, the guy, uh, and he's a man born blind. And back then, people thought that disease meant you sinned, and God was punishing you for your sin, right? Either you sinned or your family sinned. Uh, and... He was born blind, and then Jesus came along, and um, I don't know. I'm not. My focus isn't actually this first little bit. I just want to breeze over this. You can read it for yourself. Uh, the reference is John chapter nine. Uh, but the point is, Jesus comes along. There's some discussion about who's who's the sinner here. You know, what did he do wrong, all that kind of stuff. And Jesus says, "No one. There's a purpose," and um, he heals him. Right. <clears throat> And then, this, then the story for me kicks off because uh, Jesus says, I don't know, he, basically the man goes off and, and some of the religious leaders find him, right? The Pharisees find him and they say, uh, let me just find the actual beginning of this section. 
um, I don't know, just people start seeing him. People, people recognize this guy, they've seen, they've seen him begging for a while and they know who he is. And um, they're like, oh, well, how come you can see now? What's happened? And then it becomes this whole religious discussion and everything. And uh, he gets confronted by the Pharisees because he starts telling them about who Jesus is and like sort of saying he's a prophet and this kind of stuff. Um, and I think it would be good just to read a couple of the, the points. So um, if we read from verse 13 onwards, I mean, just, let's just read a few verses of that. Would Chris, would you mind reading? Yeah, yeah. sure. Verse 13. Like 13 to like, I don't know, uh, 17? Would you mind reading Yeah, sure. that section? No <laughs> problem. They brought him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. Now it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also asked the man again how he received his sight. He said to them, he put clay on my eyes and I washed and I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. They said to the blind man again, what do you say about him because he opened your eyes? He said, he is a prophet. Yeah. Um, what strikes me from this, this guy isn't like, he's not, um, I, don't, I don't know, you wouldn't say he's like, he's not speaking, he might be well educated, probably not because he was blind. Um, and I doubt he would have had access to that kind of stuff. But he just, like he doesn't speak anything amazing or, or like well researched or whatever. He just speaks the facts as he knows them as plainly as he can. Mm. And so like the Pharisees say, the Pharisees say, what happened? And he says, he healed me, you know? Um, and the Pharisees say, who do you say he is? And he says, he, he like thinks to himself and he says, well, logically, if he can heal me, that means that he comes from God, right? Because only God can perform miracles. So he must be a prophet because prophets are people that are sent from God. So he says, he's a prophet, right? Um, and then like they call in his parents and they start asking his parents about whether he, this guy was actually blind from birth and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it becomes this whole discussion. And basically just to summarize it in the end, he basically, um, they, keep, they keep going back and forth and they keep attacking him with all this stuff. And he just keeps responding with the simple truth. And that's it. That's all he does. And uh, yeah, I don't know. He gets a, he gets excommunicated and everything. And Jesus comes and encourages him afterwards. But the point to me was like um, he'd just been converted, and all he did was share the evidence he had, and that was strong enough to stand up against all the Pharisees and all the learned people. And mm -hmm. yeah, anyway, I think that was cool. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it's a little bit long-winded. I hadn't really got my thoughts together, but <laughs> that's. No, that's, that's, my, uh, that's, that's my one of my favorite little stories. So. That's super cool. I would never have different. anticipated um, <laughs> our blind guy. Is this blind Bartimaeus or that's a different story? I think that's a different story. Okay, so this is just another another one of the blind people. Another one of the, yeah. And we get a, a cool story with this one. Like, oh, that's mm -hmm. awesome. I love that. And so what was the reference for that again for people to read that at home for themselves? John chapter 9. John nine. John nine. Awesome. All right. Well, um, I'm going to, Oh, sorry. You go for it. You're right. And just like, yeah, just like, just the one extra little thing that was cool about it was that when they were asking at the start of the story, why uh, he was blind, and Jesus, Jesus actually ended up saying like, well, it's not because he sinned or anyone sinned is because I wanted, you know, basically God wants to do something through him. It's mm. yeah. I think, anyway, that's, that's another cool aspect to it. Lots mm. of cool little things to discover in John chapter nine. Mm. All right. I'm going to share my number two. So Jesse, get up, get ready. You're next. Uh, my number two, and you're going to realize this is a bit of a recurring theme with my favorite Bible characters is a guy who was very depressed. Mm. For some reason, I really like the depressed characters in the Bible. Um, and I can't say I personally relate. I've never, um, <laughs> gone through depression but i just love the intense emotion of these characters i think i just love like reading about how intensely they feel um, about what they're going through 
So my number two is the prophet Elijah. Um, and mm. I love him because I find him such an inspirational character because he keeps facing this constant opposition in his life. And yet he still continues to serve God as a prophet. So the, the reigning king of Israel, Ahab, and his wife, the queen Jezebel, they've been like inserting Baal worship all throughout Israel. And they're killing prophets of God left, right, and center. And Elijah, like an absolute boss, storms into their palace and says, there's going to be no Jew or reign for three years unless I say the word, and then walks out. Uh, like what, what, a, what an epic entrance just from the get-go. And then the next three years he spends on the run. Like he's with no other human being, has no other contact and God sends ravens to feed him. And he's just like completely dependent on God for his daily needs for three years. Um, And then after those three years, he goes, all right, Ahab, you and me, we're going to have a face off between our gods. Uh, We're going to see which God can bring fire down onto an altar. And, um, when, you know, when the prophets of Baal are trying to get Baal to bring it down, Ahab's mocking them. He's going like, yeah, yeah, ladder. Maybe Baal's asleep, you know, Hmm. maybe he's on vacation. I'm like, man, Elijah, you're too good, man. (laughs) You're too good. And then God brings down fire. And then Elijah has like, Elijah has just seen fire been brought down from heaven but he runs into the desert and he is so depressed that he asks God to take his life. He says, God, I do not want to live anymore. Um, And God meets him at this mountain and he talks to Elijah with a small, still voice and he comforts him and he encourages him. And not only that, poor Elijah, he's been alone for who knows how many years now. So he says, I want you to start mentoring Elisha. And so Elijah now has this companion to go on this, spiritual journey with um and what's also cool is at the same time as you're learning about the story of elijah and it progresses into elisha you also actually kind of get the story of king ahab who i also think is a super interesting character um god actually gives ahab victory in two or three battles and a prophet other than elijah comes up to ahab before the start of each battle and he says the lord god is going to let you win this battle so that you know that he is the true God. Um, And after another occasion, Elijah meets up with Ahab again and Ahab actually repents. And God says, Mm. because of Ahab's repentance, I'm not going to bring uh, calamity on the kingdom of Israel while he's still alive. And God only says that to two other Kings, Hezekiah and Josiah. And Ahab is also in there. And, uh, that's crazy. That's really it, crazy. It's crazy, <laughs> isn't it? And uh, like the, there's there's so many in, in the Old Testament, like in the in the Kings, in the book of, books of Kings, when they refer to a king and they they want to talk about how bad the king was, they they talk about how he went after the ways of a, a previous king who was like yeah, that's true. bad. Yeah. Mm. They had their reference points of who was a really bad king, and they had. Ahab was one of those, like, he was, yes. he was a long-lasting reference point. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Like, and he continued in the ways of Ahab, son of Omri. <laughs> so I just find it super cool that Ahab kind of has this repentance experience. Um, and as so, and then Ahab dies, and then I love, oh, this is so poetic. Elijah is taken into heaven. Um, Mm. before Elisha's eyes. And Elijah, he never dies. I love the fact that Mm. the prophet Mm. who asked God to take away his life never dies. dies. God takes Mm. him to heaven before Elijah ever has to die. That's Um, really cool. (laughs) And uh, Elijah is um, a representation. Oh, what? Rats. Um, Elijah is a representation of the believer's who will go to heaven without ever having died. So a lot of us are like Moses who died and then was taken to heaven. But Elijah is this awesome testimony to the fact that God will also take those who are still alive and remain when Jesus comes at the second coming, he's going to take them to heaven. And I just find that Elijah is this 
great character who really comforts me and reminds me that God helps his people persevere, persevere through trials and that his sto- uh, and that his small, still voice is always there for us. Um, uh, I just love the poetic nature of the story of Elijah and uh, yeah, it's a, it's a personal favorite. So my recommendation, first Kings 18 and 19, um, my favorite chapters. Um, but obviously if you've managed to find yourself in first Kings 18 and 19, you'll be able to easily navigate and find where his story fully starts and fully ends. All right, Jesse, mm. take us to number two. Awesome. Uh, but before I do that, I should say, good choice, Chris. Elijah is not in my top two, but he's in my top five. So uh, oh, I, I approve, oh, there you go. <laughs> approve, of, approve of your choices. That's no, funny. Um, like if you asked me, I don't know, maybe a month ago or two months down the track, I might have said Elijah is my top two. I think Ooh. it's funny. I heard, I heard um, uh, this guy say once about choosing your favorite Bible verse or favorite Bible character. I think he said something like this. It's like choosing who's your favorite child. It's, yeah, it's almost okay. impossible. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Very difficult, almost impossible. But um, yeah, uh, for my number two, I chose uh, Moses. Oh, so, uh, nice. Yeah, Moses has is, is always been up there for me. I mean, uh, obviously one of the great characters of the Bible. Uh, prophet, a powerful leader, you know, formerly a prince of Egypt. But um, so gifted, so talented, and yet the Bible records him as the meekest of all men on the earth, and pretty, pretty spectacular, spectacular guy, and a really interesting life as well. Great story. I love the story <laughs> of Moses. You know, um, I'm sure most of our listeners are probably aware, but if not, I'll give a brief rundown of the story. So yeah, um, born uh, to slaves, he was uh, from very early on on the run basically um because the pharaoh uh was trying to kill all the children of of israel at that time all the boys and so the mother has to mother of moses has to secretly put moses away in a basket put him on the nile river to to spare his life and he gets um found by none other than the the princess of egypt and gets raised as a prince um born as a slave raises the prince um pretty incredible and then he, he goes down the track he um he learns about who he really is. He, he um, eventually ends up killing uh, an Egyptian in order to save one of his own people. And he's like, he was being, um, he was being beaten. And then he flees from Egypt. He runs away from all that life. He lives in the, the desert as a shepherd in Midian for 40 years. And then reluctantly, God calls him back to, uh, um, to free his people, to, to take them out of slavery from Egypt. And then from that, he goes in another 40 year period through the wilderness, leading his people and um, eventually to the promised land. Although he doesn't get into the promised land himself. It's, it's a bit sad, but um, in a way he kind of gets better than the promised land because we, we find out at the end of his life, like, like Elijah, he gets to go to heaven, except Moses didn't, uh, didn't live forever. He, he died, but then he got to go to heaven. So pretty pretty amazing life i mean you, you couldn't ask for a more interesting or amazing life um but i think the main thing i really admire about moses if i had to say a few things was his closeness to god and his his humility and his dedication to his people um i think in numbers i won't look this up now but if you want to look at home i think it's in numbers chapter 12 and i think from verse 6 to 8 uh god is actually saying this about moses he says, you know, with most prophets, I speak to them through dreams and through visions. Uh, but with Moses, I speak to him face to face. Um, and so when I read about Moses, I, I'm so inspired of his, his close relationship with God. The, the fact that he spoke with God face to face, that he got to see God's glory, or at least a part of it later on, you find in the, uh, the story of Moses. But also he's, um, he's his humility and his incredible patience and dedication to his people. Um, For example, oh, before I get into that, actually, can we all look up a chapter in Hebrews 11? I want to go there first. If um, any of you are unfamiliar, in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, the author, who we believe is Paul, goes through all the faith heroes of the Bible. And uh, as I was doing my research for this, it was pretty cool to find out that 
uh, Moses actually has the second biggest portion in the Hebrews. Uh, it's, 11 massive. <laughs> it's massive. It's mm. massive compared to like some people who just get like even just the name reference. Moses gets a huge <laughs> section. Um, obviously, Abraham, he takes top spot. He's the, the father of faith after all. But I was surprised, man, Moses gets a, a decent section. Um, so I thought I'd read that out now for you guys. Actually, uh, Michael, would you mind reading that out? It's uh, Yeah, sure. It's, from verse 24, I think, through to uh, 28. Thanks. 24, sure. Yep. Uh, it says, By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated, along with the people of God, rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ, as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt, because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left it, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the application of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's really, I, I find this really inspiring. I mean, if you, if you think about uh, what life would have been like in Egypt back then, um, if any of you are familiar with a bit of archaeology, they, a lot of the tombs of the pharaohs in Egypt um, haven't produced much in the sense of treasure because uh, some grave robbers got to them first, unfortunately, and uh, took all the goods, goods away from us. Um, but there was this, this young pharaoh who died quite early, I guess, who slipped under the radar of most uh, grave robbers. Um, his, his tomb was found, and that's, of course, um, King Tutankhamun. And I think one of the first words that, the archaeologist said when he got in that tomb was gold, gold, gold. It was just filled with gold and treasure and who knows what other kind of, uh, uh, I guess, priceless artifacts. And I find it fascinating that this is the life that Moses was, was giving up, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, he was, who knows, possibly in line to be even fairer himself. He was uh, at a, at an arm's length from all the treasures, all the pleasures, all the wisdom and the knowledge of the, I guess at the time, the most powerful and prestigious civilization um, that mankind had known. And he decided to give, give all that up to, to wander the desert as a leader of slaves. And as we read the story, we find out that those slaves were very ungrateful, um, often very troublesome and caused a lot of stress for poor old Moses. But, but Moses, decided, you know what, no, uh, God has called me to a higher purpose. You know what, the, the path of, of Egypt is probably easier and it definitely probably is a lot more pleasure, but he said, no, I'm going to give that up and I'm going to take the lot that God has for me. And we read, obviously, thanks for that, Michael in Hebrew, is that Moses nice. understood something about the, the pleasures of Egypt, that they were passing, that they weren't going to last and that ultimately, even though it was probably a lot harder, that spending time with the Israelites doing what God wanted to do, leading the Israelites, and ultimately having that relationship with God was a much greater treasure than anything he could have possessed in Egypt. And I think that's pretty incredible that Moses chose the, uh, the straight and narrow, um, the path that probably seemed to him at the time a lot harder, a lot more difficult. But he saw past that, he saw to the future and realized, you know what, in the end, this is the most meaningful path that can be taken. And yeah, I've, mm -hmm. I find uh, inspiration in that when I'm faced with an easy, easy option, but realize, you know, that's, it might be easy at the time, but it's not the path that God wants me to take. And he's got something better in store for me in the long run. And I need to take that path. And Moses helps me to, to make those kinds of issues, decisions. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, so if you are looking for a cool little story that I would recommend about about Moses. I won't read it now. It's pretty big. But if you want to look up Exodus, the book of Exodus, and go to chapter 32, you'll find a pretty cool story about Moses there. <clears throat> um, so yeah, just to summarize, yeah, Moses is one of my, uh, in my top two because of his, his humility, his closeness to God, and just his dedication and love for his people, which um, I won't get into now, but I recommend uh, to go to the book of Exodus and look up chapter 32 and read through that story. And then um, keep in mind as you're reading that story, okay, where can I see Moses' love 
and dedication to his people in the story. So for you listeners at home, look up that story, Exodus chapter 32. And uh, yeah, look out for that as you read. Awesome. Cool. Cool. Thanks, Ips, Jesse. So let's go into our runners up. These are the people who couldn't make it into that top two, but hey, they're still close to our hearts. We want to give them a little bit of love. We're going to quickly go through our fifth, fourth, and third favorites. So these are the runners up there. They were so close, but didn't quite make it. So I'll start off with my number five, which is Gideon. I've got a soft spot for Gideon. Um, I've written a, an unpublished I've manuscript. Gideon five for you. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <That's> amazing. <laughs> Uh, Gideon doesn't make it any further because although he starts off well, his story ends quite kind of like tragically and sad. So, uh, and it's not kind of like the tragedy that I like, like with the depressed prophets. <laughs> so <laughs> it can only be number five. My number four is King David. Um, there, like there's basically three whole books, huge books dedicated to this guy. Sorry, two whole books dedicated to this guy. And like, his life experiences are incredible. His devotion to God is mind blowing. Um, and even God says he's a man after his own heart. Like uh, he, David is uh, a standout character. And mm. I, I do have a prediction. I have a bet that David will be someone's number one. I won't say who, and I might be wrong, but I think I might be <laughs> someone's number one. I just want to let the record show that I have clairvoyant abilities. And my number three. British noted. Yes. <laughs> my number three is Moses. So I'm in agreement with you, Jesse. Moses is one of my top. We only put him uh, a place oh, yeah. different. Um, uh, I like Moses for all the same reasons that you said. And I think one of my mm. other favorite things is the depressed angle again. It's this guy oh. who <laughs> for 40 years, he takes care of the people of Israel in the wilderness and they just treat him like mm. rubbish. But yeah. he keeps putting himself on the line for these people. He's so selfless and so self-sacrificial. I think it would, I think any, any one of us would have given up by day one with the Israelites. And yeah. he's this guy who's taken care of like maybe a hundred thousand people who all they do is complain to him. And yet he does everything for them. So Moses to me is an incredible character. So those are my runners up. Um, Mitchell, take us through your runners up. Oh, okay. Uh, so number five is Peter. Uh, Ooh, so nice. I want to, want to, want to like give a little statement quickly. I think I am like Peter, but I would like to be like John. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, like just a really quick. I, I don't know. My my. It's not actually a quote from the Bible, but my little catchphrase that I reckon Peter would think a lot would let me do that for you, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, I don't know. He just, he had a real, he had this idea that he needed to prove himself, uh, to be worth something like he needed to be doing something or being something to be valuable. Um, and Jesus had to sort of not beat that out of him, but let that be beaten out of him. Um, and then I don't know the, the story in John chapter 21 is kind of a really nice conclusion to that whole, that whole, like, I don't know, conversion story of Peter. Cause like the gospels are not Peter being glorious there, his conversion story, to be honest. So, mm. yeah, anyway, mm. that's, that's Peter. Uh, number four is Solomon. Uh, for him, it's, I don't know, it's such a really interesting, uh, like, concept that God says, I'll, I'll give you anything you ask for, and he says, I want wisdom. And so God says, mm. yes, you have wisdom. And he gives him wisdom, right? He gives him this immediately, he's immediately smart. But the real wisdom that Solomon gets, and I don't think God intended for him to fall away, but the real wisdom that Solomon gets is right at the end of his life when he's done all this wrong stuff and he's gone up and done whatever he wanted to do. He wasted his life. He gains like he gains sinner's wisdom in the sense that it'll be the wisdom that we as humans get at the end of time. Is by looking back at what we've done as wrong, we'll say, Yeah, that was wrong. God's way is a lot better, obviously. And that's mm -hmm. the wisdom he gained. Mm -hmm. And like, yeah, the the book of Ecclesiastes is a really good summary of that, I think. Um, Solomon's cool. Jonah is my number three. Oh, um, that's a good oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was great. I love Jonah, yeah. That was my number six. Mm. Ah, there um, we go. <laughs> you know what's, what's amazing about Jonah is that we, we always learn that he's got like, oh, he's, he's a disobedient prophet. 
but he has such a clear picture of God. Like he has like, like, you know, he's disobedient, but he knows God. Mm. Like, he knows God better than most other people at this time, I'd say. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because he, he, he argues with God saying, but I know you'll do this, God. And he's right. He's dead right. That is what God yeah. will do. He says, I know, <sighs> no, I know you'll spare them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think like he goes like, oh, I knew that you'd be <laughs> loving and long suffering and patient. Like, <laughs> Yes. Yep. Come back to us. Sorry, uh, sorry, my internet. Hello and died. welcome to the After Christmas podcast. <laughs> 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 That was good. <laughs> Sorry, Sorry, did you repeat what you said? I want to hear what you said. I, we missed everything. Yeah, oh, I, I, yeah. I was just going to say the yeah. I love how Jonah, uh, as you said, Mitchell. He goes, oh, God, I knew you would do this. I knew that you were <laughs> loving and patient, and like I love like the t- the tone he's saying it in is it's like an insult. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. Those are the best qualities about God is that he's merciful yeah. and. He, don't, he tries to do everything possible to avoid having to give judgment upon people because he wants people to live. Um, mm. Yeah. Mm. And, and like Just, the, the thing that does it for me is um, I've heard it justified really well. The, reasons, the reason Jonah especially was not prepared to follow God in this one is because the people he was going to help were the worst enemy of his nation. Like they, they slaughtered his people. They would carry his, you know, the women and children off. They'd do whatever they wanted to them. Like they were mortal enemies of his people at the time. And mm. how could God ask him to go and save the people that had, you know, been brutal to his own people? Mm. How, how, yeah. could, like, how could you go and help the man who had hurt your family? You know what I mean? If you're a father, how could you go and do that? Like that's, you can understand him. Um, but, but I guess the point of the story, oh, sorry, I'll wrap up really quickly. The, <laughs> the, the, the point, I, we, we got this out in a, in a Sabbath school lesson once. Um, Jonah's story is about the reason we need to witness. The whole story of Jonah, it may, you know, you think, oh, it's about Nineveh. It's about this man has got to learn, and, but he's got to go and teach Nineveh to, Nineveh to repent, right? The reality is Nineveh was there. Nineveh was with God, even though they didn't know his name. They didn't know that they could repent. They were they were ready. They were repentant in their heart. They just hadn't thrown it in their heart with whatever. The story is about Jonah needing repentance. And the way that God helps him repent is by saying, I want you to go there. Now, God mm-hmm. brought Jonah to repent. Or, you know, the story doesn't really end with Jonah repenting, but that's that's the Hope. Although, if I could add something, I heard recently, either in a sermon or read or somewhere in a book, but um, yeah, apparently some scholars think that Jonah actually wrote the book of Jonah, and that seemed reflecting on back in his life, oh, cool. uh, realizing that you know what, uh, yeah, I guess teaching others not to make the same mistakes. So, you know, <laughs> but I actually I love the fact that it ends on a cliffhanger because mm. it shifts. Yeah it kind of shifts the focus away from Jonah and puts it back on the reader. It's like, okay, like Mm. it doesn't really matter whether Jonah learned to love his enemies or not. What's more important is, do you like, Mm. are you Mm. like Jonah? Mm. Yeah. It's like the prodigal son again, isn't it? Yeah. Or do you show the love that God was going to show? It's like leaving it on this cliffhanger. You're like, Oh, what, 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 what? And then you begin to think about yourself and you're like, Ooh, ooh, I'm Jonah. Oops, like <laughs> <laughs> that is an awesome runner-up list, Mitchell. Michael, take it away. Sure. Um, well, hey, I think we might see a couple of double ups here, but um, <laughs> I mean, can you really blame me? They're, they're just they're just so good. Number five. Uh, number five on my list list is King David. Oh, uh, or or just just David. I mean, not just when he was a king, but um, I like what Chris said about this one. 
um, I find um, like <clears throat> uh, like Chris was talking about, he was saying that his characters have a bit of a similar theme, being that they were depressed. Like, <laughs> theme <laughs> um uh, i feel like my my list of characters maybe with the exception of one um i feel like the sim the theme there that kind of ties them all together is um that they, they all seem very uh very humble and very human um mm. just just very real people and i think that's what makes them relatable and that's very true of david i think um you see from from david when he was uh, when he's first mentioned, um, Samuel comes and looks at all his brothers and um, you know, he's like, this is the next this is the next king. Like, you know, um, it's, and, and I think just throughout David's whole life, just very relatable. Just um, even, uh, you know, there, there's times when he's just um, on top of the world and just doing great things for his kingdom and great things for God. Um, and then the Bible makes, uh, it doesn't dance around the fact that he was still human and he was still sinful and he didn't let that define him. Um, he was able to, able to overcome that. And that's why he's considered a man after God's own heart. Uh, and that gives us hope as well. And you can read the Psalms about David where it's pretty clear that life wasn't always great for him, but he was trusted in God. Number four, number four is a different one. Number four was Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. One. Mm, Zacchaeus, good choice. Yeah, I never would have thought. Um, that wee little I really man. like the story of Zacchaeus, a wee little man, and it's not just because I'm short, that's not. <laughs> I, just, I know I said they were relatable, but I didn't mean. <laughs> um, the thing I like about Zacchaeus, I think it's very clear in the story, Zacchaeus was so, so, it just meant so much to him Sorry. to. Jesus um it's such to him that he climbs up in a tree to to see Jesus and um and, and Jesus takes note of that you know I mean I mean how much how much um effort do we put into connecting with God to getting to know God are we willing to climb up in that tree like Zacchaeus to see God and to know God? you know and Jesus noticed him and he came. um Zacchaeus goes um he invites Jesus to his home where Jesus says look I'm coming and it's another transformation story. It's this person that's very human, encounters Jesus, and that encounter leads to a heart change. And it's genuine, and you see that it's genuine because Zacchaeus says, look, I'm going to pay people back four times as much. Um, and you can just see the transformative power of God once again in Zacchaeus. So that's why I really like that one. Awesome. Number three is Peter, same as Mitchell. Hey, that was Peter's number Mitchell. five. Uh, Mitchell's number five? Yep. Nice. Yeah, number five for Mitchell. Yeah. So there we go. So I had I had a bit higher up on the list. Similar reasons that Mitchell said as well. Actually, um, I I really like when Peter is called by Jesus. He's just sitting there and with um with Andrew, his brother, and Jesus says, "Follow me," and he doesn't hesitate. You know, I mean, that's pretty crazy. You know, imagine imagine that you're at work one day and Jesus comes along and says, "Follow me." Just just leave your work, leave your home, family. Just just follow me. I mean. Would you do it? You know, would you, would you be able to drop everything? Just go. Uh, Peter did. You know, Peter, Peter did. And Jesus said, I'm going to make you a fisher of men, not a fisher of fish. Um, and then you look through, you know, you look through Peter's story and again, very human, you know, very relatable. Um, Jesus, again, it has a transformative influence on Peter's life to the extent that Peter's, you know, he's trying to do things in his own strength and he's saying, God, you know, I'll never deny you. I'll, I will, I will, um, you know, I, I will live for you. And then he does. He denies Jesus three times. And yet Peter does something different to what Jesus did. You know, Judas has a similar experience. And um, he takes it um, pretty hard as Peter does. But Peter chooses to get up from that. And he chooses to um, to basically accept the mercy and forgiveness of Jesus. And, um, man, such an inspiring story. So... Yeah, that's why that's why Peter is number three on my list. Nice. Oh. Jesse, bring us home. Give us Sorry. these number five through three. <laughs> well, as I mentioned before, Elijah, he he's my number five. So um basically for all the same reasons you, you said, Chris, uh such a, a bold and courageous character. I, I love him for that. 
But um, what I also find ironic is that his boldness and his courage, um, that's actually where he failed. <laughs> he, he failed in his greatest strength, which is kind of ironic. Um, and right after this huge success, as you said before, and that's one of the kind of things I like Elijah for, because he teaches me a pretty, pretty important and lesson about success and how it's so easy after a huge and great win, a, a good success, just to plummet to, to depths that you, you didn't even know was possible. Uh, like Elijah from on the top of the hill, uh, victorious uh, for God. And then, yeah, asking God to kill him uh, to take his life. It's pretty, pretty massive drop. Mm. Yeah. And yeah, I was reading in a book recently. He said, you know what, if you look through all the, a lot of different Bible characters, you'll, you'll recognize that a lot of them failed in what we would regard as their greatest strengths. I think it even, it's not one of my top five, but uh, Abraham as well. If you read his story, he's known as the father of faith, and yet <laughs> faith is where he fails. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, and Moses so it's interesting. With patience too, like. Yeah. Yeah. True. Yeah. 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 Moses with, <laughs> with the people. Yeah. 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 So I was like, oh man, that's so true. And yeah, the same with Elijah, known for his courage and boldness, and yet, yeah, he runs away in fear. Um, and yeah, the the author uh, makes the point. You know, what? if we take our eyes off of God, off Jesus we will find that our greatest strengths can, um, yeah, become our, I guess, our greatest failings. And we, we start to fall into things that we never thought we ever would. Um, so I thought, yeah, that, that's a pretty important lesson that Elijah can teach me. So yeah, Elijah, definitely top five. Number four, um, I was actually weighing up between Peter or John, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, which one do I choose? Do I choose Peter, who I probably probably identify more with or John who I wish to be more. So um I, I <laughs> look <know>. at that. <laughs> <laughs> Slay Mitchell Wilson. Yeah. <laughs> so um I went with John eventually. Yeah, um John's probably got my favorite gospel. So uh I've mm -hmm. always liked John's gospel. I really love the uh the tone of his epistles as well. Very warm and friendly um and simple, which I like, but also profound, which is mm -hmm. I guess a unique characteristic of John. Um, yeah, once again, I just loved how uh, close you grew to Jesus and that inspires me to do, to do the same. Um, I guess being called in his gospel, the beloved disciple, the disciple who Jesus loved. Um, and I heard, uh, I think, a, a cool sermon that explained this a little bit that I, I thought was a cool explanation anyway. Basically, the, the guy said, you know what, it's not because uh, Jesus loved John more that he's called the beloved disciple. But it's because he felt anyway that John reciprocated to God's love maybe a little bit more than the other disciples. He responded to it perhaps in a deeper level. Um, because I guess a one sided relationship, you know, as a stop off point, you gotta you gotta have both both ways. That's what builds relationships. So I don't I, I thought it was an interesting idea. Um mm -hmm. that John gone John work with Jesus more and building that relationship. So I thought, you know, that inspires me to to grow closer to God as well. And um, number three, I've uh, actually got Samuel. Uh, oh, I don't know cool. why. I just like, I like the character Samuel. Um, I was thinking, you know what, maybe it's because he's a, a breath of fresh air after the judges. You read through the judges, yeah. it's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true though. Like, yeah, breath yeah. of fresh air. That, that's exactly what he is. Mm. And, and then you get to Samuel, and like, oh, I really like this guy. You know, from childhood but from even before birth you get the impression mm. that he's going to be a godly man because obviously Especially, you read yeah. his mother he prays for him and dedicates him to god and yet god speaking to him as a child i mean that's that's pretty cool or a, a young boy anyway that's not something you read about or hear about all the time so that, that stands out and the fact that he just lived his entire life for god um to me he's one of those characters that shows you know what if from birth to death what a life can look like if it's completely devoted to God. We don't really have any recorded major mishaps that he did. So, um, yeah, I always just like Samuel. He's pretty cool. So, yeah, that's my awesome. uh, top five. Cool. <clears throat> I like that. I like Samuel got on here. I like Samuel yeah. too. He's cool. <laughs> well, um, guys, I want to get your approval before I say this. Uh, we're already like at the 50 minute mark. So what I'm thinking is we make this part one and we record a part two another time with our top 
number one and the lightning round tier list. What do you reckon? Sounds good to yeah. me. Cool. cool. Good idea. Um, awesome. All right. I'll do a quick wrap up then. Okay, everyone. So let's, before we finish this part one of our podcast, let's go and give a rundown of our number five through to number two, just to remind our uh, listeners at home. So my number five is Gideon. Four is David, three is Moses, and number two is Elijah. Michael. My number five is David. Number four is Zacchaeus. Number three is Peter. And number two is Paul. Mitchell. Uh, Number five is Peter. Number four is Solomon. Number three is Jonah. And number two is the blind man in John chapter nine. Mm. Awesome. And Jesse. My number five is Elijah. Number four is John. Number three is Samuel. And number two is Moses. Great. That I'm pretty impressed that uh, we've got um, quite a good spread of characters, I think. Um, mm-hmm. There wasn't too much overlap. And where there was, uh, I love that most people had either very different reasons that personally attached to them or very similar reasons that personally related to them. <laughs> so like even the overlaps are really cool seeing the, the different insights or similar insights from everyone. So look, mm-hmm. listeners, I think you've got stacks of good reading to go home and do. Um, we've kind of given you each our kind of pitches for why we like each of these characters. And if, as we've described them, you've kind of really resonated with some of these stories um, or the characters themselves go have a read of the chapters that we recommended or the books where you can find them and just really go through these stories slowly. And hopefully you get to not only fall in love with the characters like we have, but ultimately really all of these characters are there to serve the purpose of showing the love of God. That's really what all these stories are here to teach us about God leading up to Jesus and uh, the ultimate sacrifice that God makes for us. So We hope that you not only fall in love with these characters, but most importantly, that you fall in love and realize the love of God uh, and how much he loves you as you read through the Bible. So you might be wondering, hey, what about your number ones, guys? (laughs) It's called part two. (laughs) Um, (laughs) This would be a super long podcast that I think we'd be reaching Christmas special levels of um, (laughs) podcast if we kept (laughs) going on for this long. (laughs) Let's call it unfair and uninspired suspense. Yes. So <laughs> what we could do, we, we could just post a, we could post a one and a half hour podcast and then viewers can just watch it at two times speed. Oh, yeah. there you go. Yeah. That sounds, that might get a little crazy. That sounds like <laughs> some terrible torture tactics used <laughs> on POWs. <laughs> Having to listen to our voices at chipmunk um, pitch levels. <laughs> You can call it ear torture. And- <laughs> oh, yeah! Ear torture! Yeah! That's a reference that Sorry. no one's going to get. <laughs> Except for hey, the four it. people in this room. <laughs> yes, ear torture. You know, if, you we- tune into, if you tune into part two, you may get a taste. Oh, you probably yeah. won't. Oh, no, um, no, we're not making any you, promises. You almost, you almost certainly will not get a taste. <laughs> come on, we have but to. They, our, but you may get a chance. I'm either our taste. intro or our outro, come on, it has to be some ear torture. We can, <laughs> we've all listened to the podcast theme before. I'm sure we can do it, an ear torture rendition of it. Anyway, <laughs> we're not going to make any promises, um, or at least, uh, yeah, we won't, we won't make any promises that we can't keep. Um, yeah we're done here (laughs) thank you so much mitchell michael and jesse for coming in and sharing all of your (laughs) favorite bible characters and to all our listeners at home we'll catch you in part two with another episode of the afterstone podcast (laughs) and uh, we hope you've been blessed as you've listened with us and with that said we hope that you have a good one and good night good night bye bro